Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. Hopefully you will like the presentation about the role of echo in the assessment of the aortic valve disease. What should I measure by echocardiography in patients with aortic valve stenosis and regurg? All the information and references were obtained from the uh, very nice paper about the recommendations of the echocardiographic assessment of the aortic valve stenosis that was released on JAYS in 2019. Regarding in the advances in the management of the aortic valve stenosis in 2020, there was a coexistence of cardiac amyloidosis in patients with aortic valve stenosis that were referred for TAVR. They have found that more than 15% association between both aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloid pathology and the outcome with TAVR is better than medical treatment. And also regarding the management of patients with intermediate and low risk patients, the results were uh, that there is no difference in the death and disabling stroke and rehospitalization page between SEVER and TAVR. However, TAVR had a higher paravalvular leaks, rehospitalization, and reintervention rates for valve thrombosis at two years in patients with uh, low risk SEVER. Regarding the current recommendations for aortic valve interventions, intervention in patients with a severe aortic valve stenosis based on the grading, including the assessment of the peak velocity, mean gradient, peak gradient aortic valve area or indexed aortic valve area in special situation. And also it's not just the echo, we have to ask about the symptoms if the patient has dyspnea, angina or syncope, which is explained by the stenotic valve. We have a new classification for the staging of the aortic valve stenosis based on the extent of the cardiac damage into five stages. Stage zero, that there is no associated cardiac damage. Stage one, that there is associated left ventricular damage. Stage two, if we have left atrial or mitral valve damage. Stages three and four, which are the late stages for the aortic valve stenosis. If we have a pulmonary hypertension or tricuspid valve involvement, and also if we have RV uh, ejection fraction reduction. And marvelously, we can see that more than one third of the patients are included in the late stages, stage three and four in this new classification. If we want to, to classify these patients according to the degree of damage based in the echo, we have to measure the LV mass. If it's increased or there is the reduction in the ejection fraction less than 50% or, or GLS also, they will be classified as, have, as having stage one aortic valve stenosis. If we have a patient with increased left atrial volume, moderate to severe mitral valve regurgitation, or there is uh, atrial fibrillation, this is a stage two. However, the dangerous stages are stage three, if we have a significant pulmonary hypertension, or there is significant tricuspid valve regurgitation. And finally, the worst stage was at stage four, if we have moderate to severe RV dysfunction assessed by TAPSI or RV ejection fraction. When we start, we have to uh, define the etiology of the aortic valve stenosis here in the left panel. We can see the upper left panel here. We have a normal triluted aortic valve with normal excursion, with normal commissures and normal opening. Here is down more than the left lower panel. This is the uh, uh, classic aortic, rheumatic aortic valve stenosis. We can appreciate that there is thickening of the aortic valve cusp, commissural fusion. We have a small triangular orifice here in the center. Here is the uh, 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 famous calcific aortic valve stenosis. We can see that there is uh, no thickening of the cusp, limited excursion, but we have a calcification is mainly seen in the bases here of the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp near the ostium of the left main. And finally, the congenital bicuspid with aortic valve. We can appreciate the opening of the valve in mid-systole, not in diastolic frame, because sometimes in diastole, we can appreciate it as trilateral valve uh, when we see the raffle. Regarding the management in patients with aortic valve stenosis, we all of us know that the patient with high gradient aortic valve stenosis, whether the ejection fraction is less than or more than 50%, whether there is symptom or asymptomatic, the patient should be referred for uh, aortic valve intervention. However, when we go to the other arm, which is the low gradient aortic valve stenosis, which is diagnosed by having mean gradient less than 40 millimeter mercury, and the aortic valve area is less than one centimeter square, provided that we have a proper aortic annulus sizing, we have used the multiple acoustic windows, we control the blood pressure and the flow status, uh, we should should assess the ejection fraction. If we have an ejection fraction less than 50%, this is a classical low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis, and patients should be referred 
for aortic valve intervention, whether the patient has a good uh, or poor contractile reserve. However, if we have an ejection fraction more than 50%, we should assess a stroke volume because if we have a stroke volume less than 35 millimeter per square meter, this is a paradoxical low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis. And if the patient is symptomatic, he should be referred for aortic valve intervention. However, if we have a normal stroke volume, this is a normal flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis. And in this arm, we don't have a specific indication for aortic valve intervention. Regarding the assessment of the aortic valve stenosis, we should use multiple acoustic window to obtain the highest peak mean gradient and peak velocity. Here is we can use the apical five chamber view or the apical long axis view. And also we have the nice right parasternal view here. This is the anatomy. This is the left atrium. This is the uh, uh, mitral valve. And here this is the aortic valve with uh, reduced excursion and dooming. And this is the asc ascending aorta. And here we can see uh, obtain the peak and mean gradient and maximum velocity across the aortic valve and calculate the aortic valve area easily. If we do not have a good window through the uh, 2D transosophageal uh, echocardiography, we can use transosophageal echocardiography using the very nice aortic long axis view. It's one of the uh, common transgastric views. Here in the cursor of the continuous wave Doppler will be aligned across the aortic valve and we can obtain the uh, maximum ingredients across the stenotic valve. To calculate the aortic valve area by continuity equation, we should obtain the LBOT, VTI, the velocity across the LBOT. We should put the cursor from three to five millimeter below the aortic valve, just immediately proximal to the conversions of the aortic valve stenosis. And the last measurement and most important and most common cause of calculation errors is the assessment or measurements of the LBOT diameter. We should use a mid-systolic frame, the best mid-systolic frame, the aortic valve at the maximum opening at the peak of the T wave. And then we zoom at this aortic valve and the LBOT and measure from the base of the right coronary cusp downward 90 degrees to obtain the maximum LBOT diameter in a correct aortic valve area calculation. With the help of the 3D echo, we can obtain nice from one 3D volume, a nice uh, unfast view of the aortic valve from both the aortic root perspective and also from the LBOT perspective. And we can appreciate nicely the opening of the valve, the number of the cusp and everything. With the help of the 3D echo, because we cannot do direct planimetry of the uh, orifice of the aortic valve, of the narrowest orifice of the valve, because we do not have a real plane alignment in 2D echo. However, in the 3D echo, with the help of the multiplanary formatting uh, software, this is in the 3D, most of the 3D echo machines, this can allow to put the cursor at the uh, orifice or the narrowest or smallest orifice of the stenotic valve. And in the perpendicular view, we can obtain the smallest orifice and trace it easily and get the uh, correct aortic valve area. Also, we, uh, in the aortic valve stenosis, if we, your patient will be referred for TAVR, uh, you should uh, report the number of the cusp if we have a nice bicuspid aortic valve or quadricuspid aortic valve because it's important. It's not, prefer not preferred in patients referred for TAVR because uh, we have a higher incidence of paravalvular leaks and also higher incidence of aortopathy and increase the risk of vascular complications. Also, we should comment in patients with aortic valve stenosis on the LBOT. And if we have an associated subaortic membrane, these patients are not suitable for TAVR. And also, if we have a basal septal hypertrophy, this is a contraindication for TAVR. And there is a, a potential reason for displacement or uh, during the procedure or after implantation. Uh, also, do not forget, if we have a normal ejection fraction, we should do a GLS, Global Longitudinal Strain, using 2D spectral tracking echocardiography. There is a nice paper for the assessment of subclinical LV dysfunction in patients with aortic valve stenosis that we were published in 2019. And they put a nice algorithm for the management of patients with asymptomatic severe aortic valve stenosis. Because if you have asymptomatic patients with severe aortic valve stenosis and have a reduced ejection fraction less than 50%, this patient should be referred to aortic valve intervention according to the guidelines. But if we have asymptomatic patients with severe aortic valve stenosis and good ejection fraction more than 50%, 
and the patient cannot do exercise, in this patient, we can use the GLS assessment. If we have more than 18, uh, minus 18% 18 uh, value for the longitudinal strain, he would, definitely the patients will need a follow-up from one to two years and the assessment. If we have a GLS value from minus 16.7, and if we have a GLS uh, from minus 16 to minus 18 percent, there will be a close follow up from six to 12 months. But if we have a GLS less than minus 16 percent, we have to look if there is associated uh, myocardial fibrosis detected by the CMR. So if we have a late gadolinium enhancement, this patient may be indicated for our valve intervention. However, further research is indicated. And if we have no myocardial abnormalities and no myocardial fibrosis, a more close follow up for the ejection fraction and symptomatology of the aortic valve stenosis at three to six months is indicated. Do not forget to look for the pulmonary hypertension because it was found in uh, nearly 25% of the patient with severe aortic valve stenosis. And it's more common in patients with low ejection fraction, patients with high filling depressions, or if there is associated moderate to severe mitral valve regurgitation. And it was found that the patient with high pulmonary artery pressure, they have a high perioperative mortality reaching 35% in patients prepared for sever. And this is a major reason for surgical turnout and decline. However, in the patients, if we have a pulmonary hypertension more than 40 millimeter mercury, this not, uh, will not affect the procedural success and early or 30-day uh, mortality rate following TAVR. However, uh, it does increase the one-year mortality to 20% in most of the patients. Also, do not forget to assess uh, the RV uh, ejection fraction. If you have a 3D uh, enabled echo machine, a 3D echo enabled machine, or you can use a special dedicated software to measure the RV ejection fraction. When we use, it's uh, important to report if the patient is going to do SAVR or TAVR to assess the prosthetic aortic annulus, because if we have in TAVR patient uh, a prosthesis smaller than required, there is high incidence of significant aortic valve regurgitation and valve embolization following implantation. And also we will have a higher risk of patient prosthesis mismatch in patients referred for SAVR. However, if you have oversight the prosthesis in TAVR or SAVR patient, there is high incidence of AV conduction disturbances and the need for permanent pacemaker implantation. So using 2D transesthoracic echocardiography, we can obtain a good parasternal long axis view or in the 2D TOE, we can obtain a vertical long axis view and 120 degrees nearly, and then zoom, get a mid systolic frame and pick up the insertion of the uh, right coronary cusp and go downward in the transesthoracic echo or upward in the transesophageal echo. 90 degrees, and then we will obtain a good LBOT diameter. Regarding the sizing of the LBOT in the 3D echo, it's important because in the 2D echo, the lack of the anatomical landmark to obtain the maximum LBOT diameter correct correctly. But however, with the use of the pipeline or extraplane mode in the 3D echo, it's superior to the single or uniplane 2D measurements of the annulus sizing. As we can see that this, uh, the same velocity of the aortic valve and the LBOT, however, the change in the LBOT diameter and increase the diameter just two millimeter high up, it will change the diagnosis of the aortic valve stenosis from severe to moderate, and this will change the decision for the patients. Regarding the shape, the 2D echo, uh, there is a major error or a bit poor that there is a geometrical assumption of the LBOT is a pure rounded or circular. However, in the 3D echo and CT also, the LBOT has an elliptical configuration. With the help of the 3D echo using the multiplanary formatting software, we can measure the uh, anteroposterior and the larger mediolateral diameter, and we can get LBOT and annular area planimetry direct and more accurate. And we can see that in comparison to the uh, aortic and LBOT linear measurements and areas by 2D and 3D TE versus multi slice CT, we can see that the 3D TE planimeter area at, at, at the B-zoom that we have an elliptical annulus is more correlated with the uh, measurements obtained by the cardiac CT. And we can see that 25% of the patient classified from moderate to severe aortic valve stenosis using 3D TE planimeter area. 
with the help of multiplanar reformatting, this import this is all the important information that should be reported for the patients referred for TAVR. We should have the maximum and minimum diameters of the LBOT, and we can obtain the area and the perimeter also of the aortic annulus. With the help of the 3D echo, we can see uh, uh, with a special rotation uh, the coronary arteries. Here is the orifice of the left main coronary artery in the short axis view and also in the long axis view. Here is the orifice of the left main coronary and its relation to the coronary cuff. And also with a special rotation here, look downward at the right coronary artery. This is the orifice and here with the use of the MPR, we can obtain the distance between the coronary cusp and the uh, right coronary, uh, uh, between the right coronary artery and the right coronary cusp. And it's important to report in, in the patient in TAVR to, uh, to assess the annular ostium distance, which is the distance from the aortic annulus to the ostium of the left main coronary, and to compare it with the length of the cusp measured in the long axis view, and it should be less than the length because we will uh, cross the aortic cusp across the uh, coronary echo, uh, and we are afraid of the coronary artery obstruction. We have a special situation that should uh, assess, which is the low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis with reduced ejection fraction, and here is diagnosed by the aortic valve area less than one centimeter square. We have a mean gradient less than 40 meter mercury, LB ejection fraction less than 50%, and finally stroke volume less than 35 millimeter per square meter. We have to use the low dose dobutamine protocol. We start by 2.525 microgram per kg per minute and increase the doses by 2.525 microgram per kg per minute every three to five minutes. We have then severe aortic valve stenosis if we have an increase in the effective area more than one uh, centimeter square. But if there is an increase in the velocity or the gradient more than 40 millimeter mercury and the aortic valve is not changed at any flow rate, this indicates the severe aortic valve stenosis. And also we have to remote, uh, report the contractile reserve because this, this is important for the assessment of the surgical mortality of the patients. We have another entity which is low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis with reserved ejection fraction. If we have aortic valve area less than one centimeter square, peak velocity less than four meters per second, mean gradient less than 40 millimeter mercury and normal ejection fraction more than 50%. In this situation, we have to use an integrated protocol for assessment of the severity of aortic valve stenosis. We have to check the symptoms of the patient. It's more common in elderly patients with a small left ventricle. Uh, we have to look for if the patient has associated LBH, but we should consider the history of hypertension and if the blood pressure is controlled or not. If we have a mean gradient from 30 to mil, uh, 40 millimeter mercury or aortic valve area less than 0.8 centimeter square, this is most probably a severe aortic valve stenosis. If we have a confirmed uh, low, stroke, low uh, stroke volume by 3D TE or CT, this is uh, more pro that we have a severe aortic valve stenosis and also the calcium scoring by the uh, cardiac CT. And also finally, at the assessment of the aortic valve stenosis, we have to exclude measurements error, like the underestimation as we have said of the LBOT uh, area and diameter. We have to control the blood pressure during examination. We have to compare the aortic valve area and velocity and gradient in the range between 0.8 to one centimeter square. And also we have to index the aortic valve area in patients with a small uh, W surface area. We have some cases here. This is a patient from our echo lab. We have a patient here with classic rheumatic mitral valve stenosis. And it seems that it's significant mitral valve stenosis in the parasternal long axis and apical four chamber view. And also, but when we look at the aortic valve also, we have in the parasternal long axis view, a thick dooming aortic valve with limited excursion. Regarding the measurements, we have a mean gradient across the mitral valve reaching 50 millimeter mercury. However, the uh, uh, calculations or measurements across the aortic valve area velocity and the gradients were not severe or high up. We went to the TE, 3D TE, to assess better assessment of the mitral valve stenosis and the uh, aortic valve opening. Here we can see in the left atrium we have a mud or dense contrast uh, floating inside the uh, flowing inside the left atrium. And from the left atrium LB perspective, we have the char char characteristic thickening dooming fused commissures of the classic my rheumatic mitral valve stenosis. And using the uh, multiplanary formatting again, we have a 3D area, a planned area, planimetered area of 0.8 centimeters 
per square. What about the aortic valve uh, stenosis? When we have the aortic short axis view at near 60 degrees in the TE, we have a classic fused commissures of the aortic uh, valve limits, very small orifice obtained from both the 2D and 3D data. And again, using the MPR technique, we have a planimeter area of 0.5 centimeter square indicating a tight or significant aortic valve stenosis. So it's some sort of low, low, low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis with preserved LV ejection fraction due to the severe mitral valve stenosis and low flow rate. And also here we can obtain a proper annular sizing using the uh, uh, 2D also TE and also the multiplanar reformatting. It's nearly 22 millimeter in the maximum and uh, mesolateral diameter. What about if the patient has double level of obstruction? This is a patient and we can see we have a significant left ventricular hypertrophy. We have a, a, a clearly seen systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and also limited excursion of the uh, aortic valve opening. Using the continuous uh, wave Doppler to obtain the P gradient, we have a resting gradient reaching uh, 50 millimeter mercury. However, with Valzalva maneuver, it increases to 90 millimeter mercury and there is late systolic peaking of the gradient. And also here in the TEE and transgastric views, we have a significant left ventricular hypertrophy. We have a SAM, we have degree of uh, significant mitral valve regurgitation. So we have here to uh, uh, tell the surgeon if the, he is going just to do myectomy for this uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or he needs to do a vertic valve replacement. So again, we went to the direct planimetry for the aortic valve opening using the MPR here, and we can see that we have an area of 0.8 centimeters square. So this patient should have a myectomy for the hypertrophied septum and aortic valve replacement. If we have triple levels or three levels of obstruction, as we can see here, we have SAM, we have a, a, a limited uh, opening of the aortic valve, and we can see clearly that we have a, a subaortic membrane attached to the basal uh, anterior septum. And again, using the right parastenal view and apical five chamber view, we have very high gradient. In the right parastenal view, we have a gradient reaching uh, nearly 100 millimeter mercury at peak systole. But here we can see another envelope seen inside the one. This is a late peaking systolic envelope here in the apical five chamber uh, view reaching 60 millimeter mercury, indicating that we have a, a, a dynamic obstruction. Again, using the TD, 2D uh, TE with color here, there is the systolic anterior motion. Here at the basal anterior septum, we have a subaortic membrane and again, the, uh, uh, the aortic valve uh, limited excursion. When we went again to the transgastric views, we have a significant left ventricular hypertrophy. We have the uh, subaortic membrane and we can get the maximum gradient across the aortic valve. Using this uh, gradient, we cannot use it to assess the aortic valve area. Uh, so the continuity equation will not be valid in this situation. So we obtain it using the exaplane and we have an area of 1.1 centimeter square. And using the MPR, it was the same area as measured by the by plane, so the patient should uh, go for myectomy, subaortic membrane resection, and aortic valve replacement. Also, with the use of the MPR, again, we can obtain the area of the LVOT over or, or the site of subaortic obstruction, and uh, we can obtain the maximum minimum diameter and also uh, direct planimetry of the area. And till now, we have finalized the uh, assessment of the aortic valve stenosis. We can go to the assessment of the aortic valve regurgitation. What's new in the assessment? We have to report the etiology and mechanism of aortic valve regurgitation. When 2D, 3D trans uh, thoracic echocardiography is an integrated approach, when to do TE in aortic valve regurgitation, and if we have coexisting valvular diseases, and we have to check some clinical cases. In 2017, again, for a, a nice paper, again, published in the JAYS at the same uh, month like the previous patients with aortic valve stenosis, for a similar classification of the aortic valve regurgitation mechanism, it's more or less like the Carpentier classification for the mitral valve regurgitation. Type 1, we have a normal cusp motion, but maybe you have annular dilatation. Type 2, we have a cusp of prolapse, and type 3, if we have a restriction or a fibrosis of the cusp. Inside the type one, the subclassified according to the dilatation of the aortic annulus. If we have an ascending aorta 
dilatation this is type 1e uh, classification like in our patients here he has an aortic aneurysm and uh, there is dissection clear, clearly seen here and the ascending aorta exceeding six centimeter in diameter if we have a dilatation just of the by sinus diameter and sinotubular junction this is type 1p classification here we have a normal aortic annulus and normal ascending aorta just dilatation of the sinotubular and by sinus diameter and also the type 1c, we have a dilated aortic annulus with normal aortic root and ascending aorta diameter. We have here a severe central aortic valve regurgitation. The aortic annulus is 33 millimeter in diameter. And finally, the last one, which is usually a complication of infective endocarditis, if we have a cast perforation, like in our patient, we have uh, from both sides, from the aortic root and LVOT, we have a perforation of the right coronary cast and severe aortic valve regurgitation. These data are important if we are going to repair this aortic valve cast uh, rather than uh, doing the replacement. Regarding type 2 classification, if we have a cusp of prolapse, like in this patient here, we have a, a prolapse of the right coronary cusp and severe eccentric aortic valve regurgitation directed against the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And finally, the classic and more common in our country, the type 3 aortic valve regurgitation, where there is fibrosis and restriction of the cusp mobility. Regarding the assessment of the severity of aortic valve regurgitation, we have to comment on the aortic valve, the root, the mechanism according to the previous classification. We have to check the LV size using the volume and dimension. We have using the color doubler to assess the jet width and vena contractor width. Use the pressure half time, regurgitant volume and fraction if feasible. And finally, do not forget the most important uh, parameter to assess the retrograde flow reversal inside the descending aorta. And also they classify the patients with chronic aortic valve regurgitation by severe if we have a, a severe parameter like frail aortic valve vena contractor wet more than 0.6 centimeter. We have a, a wet of the jet uh, occupying more than 65% of the LVOT diameter. If we have a, a small or low pressure half time less 200 millimeter uh, a second and also if we have a significant flow reversal inside the descending aorta. If we have a central jet, it's much easy to assess the as, uh, severity of aortic valve regurgitation because we will we can assess the jet width and compare it to the LVOT width. We can measure the vena contract width here clearly, and also you will have a nice and uh, flow conversions, and we can assess the regurgitant volume and fraction using the PISA uh, method. But it's much more difficult if we have an eccentric jet because it's difficult to measure to assess the ratio between the wets and wets of the LVOT, uh, obtain a nice flow conversion, so and maybe we can use the uh, vena contractor wets. Also, if you have a good apical five chamber view here, we can uh, use uh, the PISA method to assess the regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and effective regurgitant orifice area. However, it's not uh, recommended to use the volume, uh, volumetric drive the regurgitant volume because it will be uh, it's, it will be difficult because of the errors related to the mitral annular assessment and change in the diameters of the uh, mitral valve. So in this patient, it has a mild aortic regurg. We have a mild eccentric jet, small jet directed against the anterior mitral valve leaflet. We do not have a steep uh, envelope across the pressure half time using the continuous wave Doppler, and we do not have a significant flow reversal in the descending aorta. However, in the other side, we can see here, this is a severe aortic regurg with a rapid deceleration of the uh, flow across the aortic valve and holodiastolic flow reversal inside the descending aorta. What about the eccentric jets, which is more common than the central jet, and also it's difficult to assess. We, we have to uh, use a, a most reliable indicator for severity, and actually we use different parameters, not single parameter. We, we can use the vena contractor width if it's clearly defined. We can use the regurgitant flow and regurgitant fraction. The most important and most significant is the flow reversal of the aorta in absence of coarctation in these. And also we can use the indirect indicators like the assessment of the LV signs. The less reliable indicators in the patient with eccentric aortic regurg to use the jet wet or its relation to the LVOT diameter and also in the short axis view, if you want to track the jet area, but it's not accurate anymore. And also, if you have a, a good continuous wave uh, Doppler recording to obtain the deceleration and pressure half time, it's maybe difficult, but it's not impossible.
What about the rule of the CMR? It was a nice paper, again, published in the JAC in 2019, and they have, uh, they assessed the, the holodiastolic retrograde flow inside the descending aorta. And the, compared to the uh, uh, aortic valve regurgitation using the multiple echo parameters, the conventional echo parameters, and they have found the more than 6% with mild aortic valve regurgitation here, a whole of the diastolic flow reversal inside the uh, descending aorta using the CMR. However, more than 30% in patients with severe aortic valve uh, regurgitation diagnosed by echocardiography, they do not have holodiastolic flow reversal uh, on the CMR and were classifying as having non-significant aortic valve regurgitation. Moreover, this is stu they studied 40 patients with uncertain aortic valve regurgitation severity, it's moderate to severe on echo, and they have found that more, uh, it's about 45% of the patient has holodiastolic flow reversal and the CMR indicating severe aortic valve regurgitation. What we should do if we have a two concomitant aortic uh, and mitral regurgitation lesion, if we have uh, aortic valve regurgitation and mitral valve regurgitation, it's more common that the mitral regurgitation is functional secondary to the LV dilatation and annular dilatation or the ring of the papillary muscles or less common to have two organic lesions, like in patients with aortic valve disease, we may have aromatic aortic valve regurgitation and rheumatic mitral valve regurgitation. In both situations, if we want to assess the mitral valve regurgitation, the most reliable is to use the holodice, the uh, systolic flow, flow reversal inside the pulmonary veins, and also we can use the density of the continuous vein. However, the regurgitant volume and uh, uh, the volumetric approach to assess the regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction will not be reliable in both aortic valve regurgitation and mitral valve regurgitation. In the assessment of the aortic regurgitation pressure, half time is not uh, recommended anymore because there is increase in the uh, pressure secondary to the uh, mitral valve regurgitation, but we have to depend on the holodiastolic flow reversal inside the uh, descending aorta to uh, obtain the severity of aortic valve regurgitation. What we should do if we have uh, an associated mitral valve stenosis, we have to uh, uh, opposing or opposite losing condition uh, it will result in lower size, lower left ventricular size in patients with severe aortic valve regurgitation, and also it will blunt or uh, mask the pulse pressure increase. For the assessment of the aortic valve regurgitation, uh, it's not suitable anymore uh, to use the pressure half time for assessment of aortic valve regurgitation, but we can use the vena contractor width, again, the ratio between the vena contractor width and the LVOT diameter. Also, we can use the flow conversions. However, what about the assessment of the mitral valve stenosis? Because again, the area obtained by pressure half time, the mitral valve area obtained by pressure half time is not any more not any more reliable. And also, we cannot use the continuity equation because the stroke volume here is increased, the secondary falsely increased secondary to the aortic valve regurgitation. In this situation, 3D echo with the use of the MPR, we can directly obtain the narrowest orifice and uh, detect the smallest anatomical orifice of the mitral valve. Finally, to conclude, aortic valve diseases are very common, but uncommonly to occur single presentation. Three-dimensional echo can be used to obtain more accurate assessment of the aortic valve and LVOT area in patients with aortic valve stenosis. Multiple and mixed valvular heart disease are highly prevalent conditions, thus using integrative approach using 2D, 3D echo is highly recommended for single and mixed valvular heart disease. Thank you so much and hopefully you enjoyed the, the presentation and hopefully next year we can meet physically. Thank you so much.